end for the uh, last talk slot uh, for the lighting talks. Um, we have uh, Florop, and you can already see here what's going to be. And um, once again, if you are going to, to participate in the lightning slot, slot <laughs> please uh, watch the time. To try to yeah, try to sh make it short, but not you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about transmitting audio signal over Ethernet cables, so these things. Um, and particularly about the AVB-TSN protocol. Um, so this is probably going to be the like most technical talk of the conference. At the same time, it's going to be the talk with sort of the longest live demo. Um, you'll understand the comment in a minute. So some disclaimers, just to be open about this, I work on RMB Audio's AVB products, so I'm biased towards this technology, obviously. Um, opinions in this talk are my own and not that of my employer in any way. Nobody made me say that, but I feel like I should because of the next point. This talk is heavily biased towards open solutions, so open standards and open source software. Um, and that's maybe not usually what I do at work. So this is a bit different. Um, so what are we talking about? So if you have ever set up a conference like this or a concert or everything, you maybe know the cable situation on the left side there. Lots of XLR, super annoying to run, um, especially if you have long distances. And the idea is, okay, we want to transmit this over Ethernet cables. So the ones on the right, um, the top one is just your run of the mill CAT6 Ethernet cable. The bottom one is a new trick commercial um, something more robust that you might want on a stage, so someone steps on it, nothing happens. Um, so, as I said, super annoying. For example, what did we do at Sonoid 2019? So that was the last one we had in person before the pandemic. Um, we ran an analog setup. Mixer was technically digital, but all of the signal runs were analog, and we had like two times 10 meter XLR cables from the front of house to the presenter desk. We had XLR cables from the front of house to the camera for the recording. Um, we had five meter cables from the front of house to the PA and then throw lots of gaff tape on that, throw lots of zip ties on that so they go over the ceiling and nobody steps on them and nobody stumbles and gets hurt and all of that. Um, so also it forced the FOH to be like in the middle, like where people are sitting now we had to have the FOH because otherwise the cable would be twice, three times that length and that would just, we didn't have those cables. Um, Right, so what's the idea of audio over Ethernet? I already said, transmit digital audio over regular Ethernet. So we're talking about digital audio. There are also solutions which use Ethernet cables, but then use the pairs in that to transmit analog audio. So basically just XLR to Ethernet adapters, but um, in the analog domain, we're talking about digitally. So instead of doing, what is it, four channels um, in any direction, we do 100 channels routed freely over the network. Um, so the idea is to replace multi-core cables or like multiple cables um, over long distances, have some freedom of routing, potentially reuse cabling that's already in the building, right? Networks are pretty commonplace nowadays. You have like um, floor plates that you can open up. Oh, there's a network port in, in a lot of venues, particularly like if it's conferences, concerts might be a bit rarer. Um, yeah. So, so 2023, uh, today we're running an AVB-based setup. Uh, this is what I said, longest live demo. We've been doing that since 9 o'clock this morning. Um, <laughs> so it's reasonably isn't that cabling that's already in the building, sort of every like three meters there's Ethernet jacks here in the room, which are already cabled, so we don't have to like do anything about that. Um, there's a three meter cable-ish from the speaker desk to one of those plugs. Um, there's one. Um, there's two meter XLR cables from that thing into the PA. That's sort of, I'd, I'd rather have them longer and the PA in the better position, but that's what happened here. Um, and then there are two eight meter Ethernet cables like from the main switch in the back of the room to the FOH. And there are two because one is for the audio signal and one is for control. Like if you throw a few more switches in there, you could get away with a single cable. And recording this time is also purely digital, like the digital mixer is plugged into a PC and from there we're doing recording. Um, so 
a lot less cables, or you might say, well, that's not that much less. Um, I would throw into, into the bin that this time around I also had way more difficult things to do in terms of signal. Um, some people wanted like to get four signals from in the front here to the mix. So Niels had like a stereo signal from his laptop and then this mic because it's too good for our, our radio mics for some reason. <laughs> and then an instrument. Um, then an instrument and also we get uh, four channels back. There's a PA but also for example we have the microphone signal from Andrea, was it um, for for Tom? Like he used this mic over like a return channel and streamed that to a remote participant, and we could do that because we have like much more channels, much more flexibility in the routing we can do. So okay, that's sort of the motivation of why is this interesting. Um, I believe you probably, if you're like not running a conference, because that's probably not most of you, you could imagine use cases where you're setting up a stage and you also need like signals that have to run around the venue somehow. Um, so quick overview. So there are like a lot of competing protocols in like this space, like just generally transmitting signals over Ethernet cables. Um, they sort of fall into two major categories. One is ones that directly go over the Ethernet protocol. So in IT, we usually speak about this layering. You have like the well physical cable, and then you have the first layer, which is Ethernet, which is um, pretty pretty raw, just gets you sort of signals from A to B. And then we have the IP layer on that, and IP you probably all know like in some capacity from the internet. Um, and then there's sig uh, standards that work over IP and so that work directly over Ethernet. Um, the probably de facto standard in the market is sort of Dante by Ordinate, which is proprietary, so for as open source folks, maybe not that interesting. Um, right, and that works over IP. There's also QLAN from QC, also proprietary. There is AE67, which is an open standard by the AES, uh, not Advanced Encryption Standard, Audio Engineering Society, um, which is not a full solution, though. You get sort of the idea of how to run signals over a network, but you don't get anything for like controlling the devices that are providing the signals or how to actually connect them among each other remotely. Um, there's Ravenna, which is also an open standard, which is a solution based on AE67. And also, I should say, it's sort of um, the one redeeming quality that Dante has is you get a AES67 compatibility mode in every Dante device, so you can get an open standard all of those out of those if you really want to. Um, then at the other end of the spectrum, where we are today, audio over Ethernet. There are also a few proprietary ones like Robonet by Sirius Logic or Easystown by Digigram. Um, but today we want to talk about ABB. This is an IEEE standard. IEEE standards are the, uh, IEEE are the same folks that also specify Ethernet itself. Um, and sort of as an extension to that, there is Milan by the Avenue. Avenue is sort of such an industry consortium for ABB people. So companies that build ABB products um, are part of this consortium. And they build a standard on top of that. And I'll talk a bit later about what that is in a moment. Um, so, because we're at Sonoy, I want to talk a bit about open standards, because what does it really mean? Um, sort of, if we're thinking in terms of something like the IETF, you'd usually think that, okay, it's an open standard, you can read it, distribute it, participate, like in, in the IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force, it's basically just you join a mailing list and then you can contribute to that. You can always see drafts and all those things. Um, and sort of a bit more commercial settings, that's not always the case. For example, the, in the AES, standards are free to implement, uh, usually not patent encumbered, or at least the patents are not being enforced. Um, but they are, for example, pay to read, so you cannot access those standards without paying a fee for accessing them. Um, it's also free to contribute, <laughs> which um, is a bit, you'd hope it would be, right? Because like doing the standard work is something that's usually pretty annoying and not everybody was, wants to. Um, and the AES says, like, if you're someone who's concerned with that matter, you can contribute to the standard and, like, help defining what should go into it. Um, the IEEE is basically the same thing with one disclaimer that pay to read is not completely true. The 802.1 working group, which is instantly the one that's also concerned with Ethernet, so relevant to a lot of the AVB things, uh, those standards become free eventually after time. I think it's a year after publication or something. 
Um, and right now, I think everything that's relevant to AVB, even in its most recent version, is actually free to read. Um, the avenue is a bit of an odd one and <laughs> annoying to me. So they're free to implement, they're also free to read. Um, you have to enter a email address to read them, but, um, but they are basically paid to contribute. So you only get to see drafts and work on drafts and work on standards if you pay them. And not even just pay them anything, but pay them in one of the higher tiers. So it's not really accessible for probably open source projects and not even for like smaller firms. Um, so, okay. What's AVB TSN? So AVB is the audio video bridging standard. It's been around for a while. It's been published in 2011 for the first time. It's been worked on even longer, I think like 2004 or something. Um, as the name said, it's not only concerned with audio. It's basically transmitting audio or video signals over Ethernet networks. Um, and why you see AVB slash TSN often is that I think just a year later, the working group was named and extended to time-sensitive networking um, because the same properties that we wanted for transmitting audio, like doing it in a real-time fashion and doing it reliably, people also wanted for industry things. So like controlling industry robots and like a planetary plant and all that. Um, so the standards sort of got extended to do a lot more and different things and that's why it's often also called time-sensitive networking. Um, the big downside of it is sort of that it requires AVB compatible switches um, or bridges, which is the official term. So you can't just use any run of the mill switch. You can like reuse cabling, but you can't reuse switches that might be in a building necessarily. Um, so what is Milan? I sort of teased this. So the problem is sort of obvious at this point, right? You have like TSN that might be implemented by an industry robot and by an audio device. And like the chances of sending I don't know, a uh, 48 kilohertz audio signal to an industry robot and it doing anything useful with this are sort of slim. <laughs> um, so we needed something that would sort of define a profile for just what pro audio needed. So that pro audio devices at least could talk to each other and not like um, all hone in on different aspects of the standard and implement different, um, different formats for transmitting data over the network which even just in the audio um, aspect of AVB, there is like different formats. There's one that's basically transmit firewire over an Ethernet cable and another one of which is like more plain samples over the cable, right? Um, so it was necessary that sort of people would agree on one thing to do and then everybody could talk to each other, hopefully. And that's what Milan is meant to be. Um, it was specified by the Avenue Alliance um, and as I said, a common set of subset of AVB. Um, there's also some extensions to the standard in there. It adds automatic reconnection, so like if you pull an Ethernet cable, plug it back in, then everything will just magically come back up and be connected like it should be. Um, and it also has redundancy, you can, so you can run two completely separate networks, uh, connect them to separate ports, and then if one network fails, like, um, I don't know, camper runs over it and uh, breaks the cable or something, the other one just steps in and seamlessly transfers to the other network. Um, unfortunately, I also decided to redefine some bits of the standard, which is not really how you do profiles. Um, at least they were somewhat aware that this is not a profile because people um, discussed with me at the Tonemeister talking that, well, no, this is not a profile. Um, and my stance on that is, well, yes, but that's a bad thing. <laughs> because it means you can't really be AVB and Milan compliant at the same time. There is like little things that, that are different. Um, fortunately, that does not inherently break them working against each other, so you can have an AVB device and a Milan device and they'll still talk to each other. Um, but it's still a bit annoying, especially as an implementer. So, okay, what's, what are the goals of the whole thing? In this case, Milan, but I think it's, it's broader. Uh, so Henning Kaltheuner from DNB Audio Technik says, it's to get the ease of analog XLR connector transformed into full media data interoperability. Um, and of course, I mean, to some extent, it's, it's marketing. But the other thing is, I think that's a sensible goalpost, right? Like, be as easy as XLR. Um, so I thought, well, okay, let's see what we would need um, if that's our goal. So we do Ethernet networking and transmit audio of that, but we want to be as easy as XLR. So it must be plug and play, right? Um, just plug it in and it sort of works. 
we need low and constant latency. I mean, of course, we're not going to get as low as an analog signal, but it shouldn't be as high that it's unusable, right? Like somebody should be able to stand here and play guitar and the signal goes through the ethernet and it's not annoying or off-putting. Um, we want all devices to have a synchronized word clock. Um, I should probably ask who is not aware what the term word clock means. <laughs> okay. Um, who thinks they know what a sample clock is? Better question. A sample clock? Okay, so um, then I'll, I'll try and explain. Um, so in digital audio, we have samples, right? You all know this. And then we have the sample rate, which is like how often do you take a sample? Um, and the word clock, and, and like in some more professional devices, there's also connectors called the word clock connector, usually like a BNC connector. Uh, it's basically a clock that ticks once every time you're supposed to take a sample. Um, and so this clock, is supposed to be, should be synchronized over the whole network, right? So everybody should be taking samples at the same time and not like at different, different things so you don't get weird issues with phasing or whatever. Um, so that's word clock. Then we want low jitters, so the clock should stay witness in a consistent frequency band. Um, we want synchronized playout. I mean, that would also be sort of annoying if one speaker played a bit sooner than the other one, obviously. Reliable delivery. Um, whoops. <laughs> not that. Um, reliable delivery, so data shouldn't get lost, shouldn't be glitchy in the way. And we would sort of working generally under hard real-time constraints. So in engineering, when we're talking about real-time constraints, we basically mean work needs to be done by a deadline, right? So in this case, like audio needs to be delivered and played out and all that by a deadline. Um, and you differentiate into sort of two aspects. One is like soft real-time constraints, which is okay, if you, if you don't get the deadline, it's not that bad. And then hard real-time constraints. Uh, which is, well, if you break the deadlines, that's mission critical. So, like, you lose a lot of money, somebody dies, something like that, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, le legitimately, like, usual examples are something like at a factory plant, uh, I don't know, systems that are supposed to be synchronized, the second one is too late, and, like, um, your metal bounces against something, falls down, everything, like, big mess. So, actually, potential human harm, right? Um, so that's hard real time. And since we're sort of in pro audio and like maybe we're running a gig, maybe it's like a big festival and a lot of people paid a lot of money for it, um, it's critical, at least in terms of money, right? That this actually works by the deadline. It is not glitching all the time. So we're sort of working under hard real time constraints. here. Okay. Um, Quick intermission sort of terminology, I already said bridges, and I'm going to try and talk about bridges because it's a standard term, as what we usually call switches. So like right, network devices that you plug a lot of cables in and then packets pass through them magically. Um, and each device in an AVB network is called an AVB entity. There are three different types of them. There are talkers, which are devices that talk to the network, so send audio data or any type of data, but in our case, audio data. Um, listeners, which are devices which receive this data and then usually play it out or something like that. And controllers, which are devices that manage those two, right? Do something to them, connect them, those kind of things. Um, and this is not mutually exclusive. Like one device can be a listener and a talker or also a controller. OK, so let's sort of, I want to look at um, how we achieve each of these things, sort of briefly and then also where we sort of are in the open source world in terms of like software that actually exists to do the things that we need to do, right? Um, so synchronization. Um, the way we synchronize is, uh, do synchronization of the word clock is we first establish a synchronized network clock. So we have sort of a clock that all devices on the network agree on, which is clocked significantly higher than the word clock. And then what we do is for each word clock tick, we sort of send a timestamp of when that tick happened over the network. So the receiving device can then um, put those timestamps together to recreate the word clock that was at the originating device. So the, the picture at what I'm sort of supposed to demonstrate that so the blue stems are sort of network time ticks, right? And then every nth of those, and n is a lot of higher than it is here in the picture, but just so you can actually see it. 
um, you have a word clock tick, and then that word clock tick would get transmitted so people would know when. Um, so how do we create such a network time then, though? Um, that's done via the Generalized Precision Time Protocol, or 802.1AS. You might also see the term AS-capable sometimes. Um, that is where that comes from. And that's a profile of PDP version 2. So PDP, the Precision Time Protocol, obviously, um, is sort of similar to NTP. The NTP, a lot of you probably use to like keep your phones or computers or whatever in sync with actual time, but it's like way more precise. Um, like at least when I was there, they were using it like at the at a Mary Club in Braunschweig and stuff like that to distribute the clock signal across the facility. Um, so it's sort of to be thought of like a service provided by the network. So it's not a, like a protocol that individual devices on the network speak, but like the whole network has to participate in this. Um, so each network device actually has its own clock and has to sort of be aware of the protocol being spoken. This is part of why you need specific bridges to do AVB and cannot use um, your everyday bridge. If you want good synchronization, you need like a hardware support. Um, so and your network card specifically needs to be able to like timestamp packets going in and out of it. Um, that is somewhat common and somewhat uncommon. Um, like Intel network chips usually do this, even like in your run-of-the-mill notebook. Um, I have not seen it in, a in AMD devices yet, and various like USB Ethernet connectors generally don't have it. But on the flip side, like most embedded processors do have it. Like if you just buy anything by NXP or STM or whatever, or I think a lot of the Raspberry Pis too, they have this capability. Um, right. So and then synchronization is done in a so-called leader follower architecture. So we have sort of one person saying, okay, this is the time that everyone else tries to agree. And each segment on the network, so that's usually just one cable, agrees on a leader. So you have two peers and you agree which one of you is the leader and which is the follower. Um, and the whole network as a whole um, elects one grant leader. So that is sort of the way that decides how the clock works, right? So they tell you what the clock is. And then everyone else um, throughout the network just also gets that time. Um, and there is a solution to actually do this under Linux. It's Linux PTP, which is the de facto standard PTP demon on Linux, I think. Um, and it has GPTP support. Like there's a um, standard config provided that you can just load, and then providing that your hardware also supports it, you can do GPTP in the network and you get. A synchronized clock. You can also synchronize your system time to that clock and um, hopefully be happy. Uh, I'll, I'll actually probably should tell you now why, why I hope you'll be happy. So the problem with that is that usually in the systems the time on the network is not the wall clock time. So you just you start a switch and that switch acts as sort of grant leader and it starts at its own timer at beginning of 1970, something like that, and then distributes that time throughout the network. So setting your own system time to that is sort of a bit annoying if you want to use it that way. Um, yeah, But some, some software unfortunately requires that. So stream delivery, how do we actually get data from A to B? Um, there are a few ways that we could do that. So there's like your typical unicast, so just address the data to someone via a MAC address. Um, and then send it there. So if we have multiple listeners on the network, that means we have redundant data, though. So we would have to send data twice, three times, depending on the number of listeners. Um, and of course, it wastes bandwidth. And subsequently, it wastes potential channels, right? Because on each link, you have more data, so you can transmit less channels. And there is broadcast, which is sort of good for the talker. It only has to uh, distribute. It only has to send one stream of data. Um, and it gets to every listener, but it is bad for those who are not actually participating in the audio network, right? So there are some links, for example, in this graph where we don't actually need audio data, but it's still transmitted um, and wastes, wastes capacities. Also, if we had like a, a different talker and listener pair overlaid over here, um, it might also reduce their channel count in turn, right? Um, and then we have multicast 
which is basically delivering the same data to multiple specific people, but just those who asked for it. Um, so you address your data to a multicast MAC address, specific thing, and then the people who want to listen to it request that multicast MAC address and get the data. Um, again, the downside of this is it requires support from the bridges in the network, so you have to buy specialized bridges. Um, yeah, there, relatedly, there is a MAC address acquisition protocol, which is just a way to get those multicast MAC addresses. So we need something that implements that if we want to do that. Um, it's pretty basic. It basically just asks the network, hey, is this address available? And if no one says no, then you have that address. Um, then there's reliable delivery. So the problem we're sort of facing is, okay, we can get data from A to B, but in an Ethernet network, um, you have various buffers, and you have like conflicting data data streams. So someone who's like surfing the internet or downloading something from a file server um, would sort of hinder you from getting your audio data to through potentially, right? Or either you're actually not getting it through, and it gets dropped, and you'd have to resend it, but then it's too late. Um, or just generally, it gets too late. Like maybe you even get it through, and it gets to the receiver. But sending data takes time, and sending data is always sequentially on a cable. So if there's one like data packet still in transit from whatever else, and you need to send all your data in that time frame, that's also a problem. Um, right. So the solution is that we need to somehow reserve our bandwidth so that um, other that our packets get priority when they're being delivered before others. So um, prioritization works like this. We have switches which sort received data into multiple queues. So right, just your average queue. Um, and there's one per stream priority. So streams might also, like audio streams, might also have different priorities. So those at higher priority come before those at lower priority. At some point, there comes best effort traffic. and what Best effort traffic here means is basically your usual network traffic, what you're doing every day if you're using a network. Um, a prioritization is done based on VLAN priority tags. So what are VLANs? VLANs are virtual LANs, so basically a way to segment a physical network into like multiple um, virtual local ones that act as if they were a physical network. Uh, and the nice thing in this context is that they have a way to um, also assign a priority to that network. So basically you just have regular data and it's prefect by a tag that says, okay, but I belong to this and that VLAN. Um, that is in particular nice because most hardware has a way to filter that out. So if you're not actually interested, you can throw those packets away. Um, right, And they're also usually only forwarded by bridges to ports that are configured to receive that VLAN. That brings up another problem because configuration is sort of contrary to our thought of plug and play. So usually you'd have like a Cisco or not switches and you would say, okay, this and that VLAN goes to ports three, four, and five. Um, and that's not what we want. So there's again a protocol for that. That's a multiple VLAN registration protocol, which allows devices accessed, uh, attached to the bridge to request getting a VLAN. So instead of going onto the bridge and like configuring things, each device can say, okay, I want that VLAN and then get it. Um, obviously, that is in, in some situations also a security hazard, so there would be ways to disable that, but sort of for the plug and play way we want in the AVB networks, that's what we have. Um, and there is Linux support actually, relatively good one. Like VLAN support has been in the Linux kernel for ages. And for a while, it also even had uh, MVRP support. So what you do is basically just you add a new network device to your system based on an existing one, and then tell it to turn MVRP on on that, and then you just get those packets on that device. Um, I won't go into the detail of that line, but that's how you would add one of those. Then there is traffic shaping, which we need additionally. So similar to what I said about um, like traffic happening could starve or get rid of your audio packets. It also can happen with multiple streams at, if they just send at full speed. So even if you have multiple streams and they fit onto your network, if all 
frames from the highest priority get sent first, you might get into a situation where data is available and it gets sent, but within the time frame where that data was sent, a lower priority stream would have to be sent to be in time. And if it was just sent, it would have been okay for the higher priority stream. It would have had um, time because it already had set a packet just then, um, but because it was higher priority, it was emptied first. So because of that, each of our queues needs sort of a way to um, limit its bandwidth. So don't send everything immediately. Send it when it's your time to send it, right? Um, AVB in specifically uh, uses a, a credit-based shaper, it's what's called algorithm for that, um, which is basically just everybody, or HQ has an amount of credit, uh, which grows over time, and if you're at a certain threshold, you just send a packet. Um, and sending a packet costs credit from that account. So you sort of um, restrict your bandwidth that way, right? So. You, you send a packet, your credit gets down, you have to wait so other people can send packets and then you can send one again. Um, which means then, though, that for each of those queues, we need to know how much bandwidth they actually require. Because if those, um, those credits grow too fast, they would send too early um, or before they actually need to. And if they go too slow, they can't send when they need to send the next packet, right? So need to, we need to know how maybe megabit per second sort of they have to send in order to get their data through the network. Um, am I? Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll actually script that slide for now. So there's, again, a protocol for that, um, MSRP. There are like a lot of fancy acronym protocols in here. The multiple stream registration protocol. And how that works is basically that talkers advertise that they have a stream and that advertisement also says for that stream, for transmitting that stream, I need this amount of bandwidth, and it has this priority, it goes into this virtual LAN, and all of those things. And then bridges in the network broadcast that information to everyone. And then a the listener can declare, okay, I want that stream. Um, and once they do that, bridges start reserving those bandwidths, configuring the queues correctly with the bandwidth that they now know about, and then pass the stream along from the talker to the listener. Um, so, right, for, for general traffic control, there is support in Linux again, um, via the QDisk subsystem, and QDisk has support for the credit-based shaper, which I mentioned before. Um, if you want details for this, there's generally tsn.readsadocs.io has like a lot of documentation about um, time-sensitive networking and how to set that up and the logics. Okay. And then, sort of a, a bit separate from all of that, there's control. Um, so we don't just want to like, deliver audio packets reliably, we also want to know what devices are on the network. We want to connect those devices, we want to control those devices, right? Um, and AVBTSN has AdTech for that, the AVBTSN Discovery and Enumeration Connection Management and Control Protocol. Uh, quite a mouthful. <laughs> um, specified as IEEE 1722.1. Unfortunately, not in the 802.1 domain, so that one is for pay. Um, and it's comprised like of a big variety of sub-protocols. Like it has the ADP, the AdDeck Discovery Protocol for finding devices, the ACMP, the Connection Management Protocol for connecting to devices in the streams, um, the Enumeration and Control Protocol, which is like finding what's available on a device and controlling aspects of the device, and then there's the Entity Model, which is sort of a abstract description. And the ACP is used to sort of find and read that entity model and then make changes to it. Um, and there's also software for that available. Hive, um, which is, do I have, yeah, uh, which is an attack controller available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, Linux is sort of an afterthought, unfortunately. It's not like regularly tested. Um, though I sufficiently do bug the developer if it doesn't work on Linux. <laughs> um, and they are pretty good about responding. Um, it's developed by Alacoustics, a French firm, and mostly by just one of their employees, unfortunately, so he doesn't get much help as far as I can tell. Um, and it does like discover entities, you can connect things, even has alpha quality based routing on individual channel basis. So I'll, I'll show you in a moment what I mean by that. Um, 
you can manage the clocks, so whose word clock is the one that everyone else should use, um, and also what like clock each device should use, if they should use their internal clock, or maybe one coming in via a word clock connector or a MADI connection or something like that. Um, and you can modify controls. So um, I have some screenshots, but I think I'll actually just like show you the, the real thing, because I said we have a have a AVB network here. Um, so this is sort of a bit small among other things, but um, this is what we currently have here. So we have a, I'll refresh this real quick. We have someone in the back running another instance of, of Hive <laughs> to control things. Um, but then we have like an RME device, which is this fancy thing here. This is where break the PA, the bed. Um, and we have a Studio Live mixer in the back, which also supports AVB. So really just two devices sending audio data back and forth. So if you plug in here at the front, which a lot of people have done today, um, those channels go to the back, to the mixing desk, and then the signal is mixed there and goes back here and goes into the PA. Um, we can look at the connections. So there's a connection matrix. So it's, it's done in sort of streams of, of channels. So each channel contains multiple streams, and you can then connect them. Um, in this case, it's just one Studio Live send stream to the AVB uh, to the RME device, and one of the stream from the RME device to the Studio Live stream. Um, so, how do we actually tell them tell the devices what should be in those those streams? Um, so, yeah, what you can see here on the right is the AEM that I talked about, the entity model, right? So, there's sort of a tree-like enumeration of what's in each device. Um, there's an audio unit. In audio units, we have stream ports. And for example, what am I on? Um, stream port two here should contain all the microphones. And then I can like look at a routing and say like, okay, those four microphones are routed to the first four streams of the first output stream, and then that goes to the back, right? Um, sort of very similar to like what Carla has as a view. Uh, right, um, and then also there's like a lot of controls here. It's not necessarily a nice view of them. I wish that it would would improve. In particular, AVB has actually a lot of information about these controls, like it deals in what unit they are and like what power of ten the data is represented in. So you could sort of show them really nicely to the user if you wanted to. Um, but a lot of that is unfortunately not there. Also, it doesn't show a lot of controls that exist for like adjusting gain which would be nice because then you could just do that remotely. Um, but like just to maybe do a quick demo and show that this is actually sort of working, um, there's an identify control here, so just sort of blink some LEDs, and if I toggle that on, you can maybe see there's like a lot of blinking going on here um, for as long as that's on, and then I can turn that back off. Right, so that's Hive. Um, So what about our goals? Um, we set a few goals in the beginning, like um, how are you doing? Does this actually work? So plug and play to some extent. Um, so bridges are being configured by SRP. So SRP are actually like the, the overarching protocol for like MSRP, MVRP, MAAP, all those things that I mentioned. So they are automatically configured so that streams go through them. Um, obviously, it's not like an XLR cable. You plug it in at both ends and it works. That's also maybe not what we want, because like if we're transmitting 100 streams, if you plug a cable, an Ethernet cable into both ends, where do those 100 channels actually go? Like there, unfortunately, must be some amount of configuration. Um, but bridges are configured by SAP. Also, the GPDP, so the clocking, works plug and play. So you plug a device into a network, and it automatically synchronizes without any user intervention to the clock. Uh, low and constant latency um, exists. It's two milliseconds over seven hops is 100 megabits, but can also be less, particularly if you have like less hops, so less bridges in between, or a gigabit Ethernet. Um, you can go way beyond one millisecond latency over one network link. Um, well, not not one network, one network connection between two devices. What I mean. Um, low jitter is, I think, sort of debatable. Um, GPTP needs for avenue compliance requirements uh, less than plus minus 80 nanoseconds accuracy. Um, for reference, a 48 kilohertz 
like word clock signal between two ticks, you have 20 microseconds. So there's a, like an order of magnitude in between that. Um, synchronized word clock we have with GPTP as well as synchronized payout. We have timestamps on each of our samples, and since we have a network clock, we know exactly when to play things and when clocks appear. Um, and for reliable delivery, we have prioritization and shaping. Right, so um, things are preferred towards like your best effort, usual traffic, and they are shaped so that they don't get in the way of other things. Um, hard real time constraints, I don't have a like check mark or not for that because I think it just sort of follows from all the other points. Right, so um, I mentioned open source software throughout, but I had sort of a bit of an overflow of what I still wanted to mention. So, um, I mean, in our ideal world, right, I would be able to send audio data from a Linux system over this cable and just straight to the PA or whatever, or to the mixing desk. Um, no need to have like a device standing in front here, everybody just plugs in and then gives us a signal. That would be nice. Uh, unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. Um, there are some things. There is Open Avenue, formerly Open AVB, which is a project contributed to the Avenue by Intel. Um, and it's a bit, it is in theory everything in the kitchen sink. It has demons for all of the protocols I mentioned. Um, it has other plugins. It has Jack demons. It has GStreamer plugins. Um, and it has two major problems. <laughs> One of them is it only, it pretty much only works in the Intel i20, i210 network card. So one very specific PCI card or chipset. Um, some of the demons at least claim they work on other things with like generic Linux drivers, but not really in my experience. And also all the documentation is mostly like, yeah, load these custom kernel driver for the i210 and then this works. Um, and also, I have not been able to even just get it compiling against the current libc. Um, it's, it's not maintained as well as one would hope. <laughs> Um, so yeah, everything in the kitchen sink is also, let's say, hard to get working. Um, then there are, in also mainline, um, AVTP plugins. So AVTP is like the data stream format for sending uh, data over the network. Um, so it doesn't actually do a lot of the things that we need for reliable delivery, so it doesn't set up virtual LANs, um, it doesn't know how to connect streams and all that, but, well, pretty much if you have two devices using this other plugin, you can send AVTP data between them, um, which is, I guess, the first step. Um, it needs a lot of manual configuration too, which you can see on the right, uh, which ideally we wanted to be plug and play, that all wouldn't be there. Uh, but at least also has a way to send those data. We just need to get it sort of in the correct VLAN and have a lot of things around that and it would work. Um, and this is one of the things that need synchronization of the system time via GPTP. And I said before, this is sort of, you don't really want to synchronize the system time to GPTP because then it's 1970. So that's not nice. Um, GStreamer similarly has in GStreamer bad AVTP plugins for audio clocking and even for video. Um, so with these plugins, you can send network streams for audio, you can send a clock over the network to or from an AVB device, and you can send even X, uh, well, any video, I think, in, in a decent container and format. Um, it has the same shortcomings as the other plugin, pretty much, so like it's not integrated into AVB the way it's supposed to be, sort of. Um, you have to set your system time to GPTP, and yeah. Um, I have some hope that that could improve, because GStreamer does have a PTP element, so a PTP plugin, um, that just doesn't support GPTP, so the specific version that AVB uses yet. In theory, if that gained GPTP support, you could synchronize your clock to that instead of to your system clock, and then you wouldn't have to set your system clock to like 1970 all the time. Um, then there is initial AVB support in Pipewire, which is sort of interesting. Um, the problem with that is that it really is initial. Um, it works. If you start it, it will turn up in something like Hive. Um, but there's no clock synchronization, which is obviously a big problem because then you don't even know when to sort of play samples. Um, might work to some extent if all you want is sort of a backup recording because then you can just 
receive samples from the network and like store them away and you don't care about what the clock exactly was, as long as you have the data. Um, and various things, when I last tested, were incomplete or buggy. Like I was successful getting data from Pipewire to one of my devices, but not in the other direction because the bridge would just refuse to actually pass it along because things were off in Pipewire. Um, again, I have some hopes for that because Pipewire also has AES67 support and that has clocking. And that same clocking mechanism that's used uh, could also be used for AVB as far as I'm aware because it just clock to hardware clocks provided by Linux and Linux PTP can um, set those via GPTP. So that would in theory have support and without changing the system time too. Just needs to be implemented. Um, so what's missing? Um, a lot of things. So there are, there are various things and components and they work if you use them with themselves, sort of, at least to some extent. But necess not necessarily with AVB compliant equipment and they're not necessary, at least on their own AVB compliant. Um, so there would be a need for a full talker and listener implementation with like ACMP, so connection management, um, getting multicast addresses and configuring bridges via MSRP. And then a lot of integration and convenience would like really be helpful. Um, for example, you have to, like I showed you how you would add a VLAN interface to your system. But the reality of the thing is that the VLAN which you need is required, uh, is dynamic and different on each network potentially, and can be set like by a network administrator. So like for each network you enter, having to look at eh, what is it here, and then adding a new device, and maybe that device even changes during the time you're there, also like the device that you would need. Um, that's like super annoying, that would ideally need some support from the kernel. Um, also then setting up queues which like bandwidth restrictions on that on that device, uh, making all of the required declarations to the bridge and the network. Um, there's a lot of integration just missing. Um, as I said, Open Avenue is in theory everything but the Christian thing, like it provides all of this. In theory you just have to get it working. Um, which maybe it's just that I've never had an I-210, maybe I would, would be much happier if I did. All right, and that's it for me. Um, thanks for listening to my technical ramblings. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thanks for your talk, that was really interesting. Uh, I have a lot of questions, uh, I try to keep it short. <laughs> so le let's say you have a generic bridge, so a non-AVB specific AVB support, what happens in that case? Um, what happens in that? That's actually a good question, and I've for a while not thought about that. I'm, I'm usually in the opposite, um, opposite situation, that I have an AVB at very bridge and it just won't pass data along because the, the end devices are not AVB enough. Um, it does transmit the data. I think what usually will happen is that the ports on the AVB devices are supposed to not accept the data because um, for sort of a port to be, so port meaning a link between two devices, right, like a bridge and your endpoint, uh, to be AVB capable you have to at least speak GPTP, so have like the time synchronization. And when you notice that the device on the other end, so the bridge does not actually speak GPTP, you say, well, no, I won't take packets from you. And uh, let's say with uh, gigabit Ethernet, how many streams, just to give a ballpark figure, could you go st get through that? Um, I'm actually really bad at remembering those things. There is a nice tool, uh, abc.statusbar.com, is it this thing? Dot com? Yeah. Um, the, the AVB bandwidth calculator. So you can say I, I have one gigabit and then the maximum bandwidth reserved for audio streams is like 75%, which is what bridges usually do. Uh, then you actually chose a reasonable stream protocol, let's say single speed, 24 bits per sample. Um, and then how many, let's say we get eight channels per stream, that's also what we usually do. And then we get 440 channels per network link. That's gigabit Ethernet. Yeah. So that's quite reasonable already. Uh, so um, 
you mentioned in the beginning that there is this AVB, but also that IP-based stuff. Stuff are there bridges to get from Ethernet-based to IP-based? Um, yes, I mean in, th in theory, those things are also not mutually ex exclusive. Like you could use the AVB technology to then transmit an IP protocol with like guaranteed bandwidth and guaranteed delivery and all of that. Um, but also there are devices that are being sold that bridge, for example, from AVB to Dante, like every Sonos has one of those where you have two network ports and then on one side you get AVB and the other get Dante. And just uh, to get the clarification there, uh, this would be a mix of uh, Ethernet shared with whatever other network access you have at the same time, right? So you uh, can uh, run on the same network, you can run uh, your AVB stuff, like for example here, but you can also use this for whatever other stuff is happening at the same time in the same network. Oh yeah, right, yeah, that's that's sort of meant to be like one of the major benefits, right? That like you can, um, on the same bridge, like you have your normal internet connection, which people might, in other scenarios, feel like would be unsafe because it takes up bandwidth. Um, yes, because everything is reserved and like guaranteed bandwidth, you can do other things on the same network. So why would you then have a separate control link like you mentioned for here in the beginning? Um, purely lack of bridges. <laughs> okay, um. uh, fair enough. And my last question, uh, as far as I know, uh, I'm not sure if this is a qualified question for here, but uh, uh, as far as I know, Max would also support AVB. Do you know by chance if it's Milan based or just pure AVB? Um, no, I've actually not heard that. Uh, I've heard of a few people who are starting to also support AVB, but not of Max. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, the ones with C, not the ones with X, because there's a company. Um, yes, Max support AVB in the operation system. It is not Milan, and also if you have a Milan device, they will now spit out a big warning in your face. This is a Milan device. Don't trust it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you're saying like there's a lot of stuff missing uh, on the Linux side, it's, from my understanding, mostly in user space. Um, so is it correct that like the kernel is out of the box ready for AVB, or is there like any modules or any like specific flags I need to configure when compiling the kernel? Um, that's sort of a good question because there's no like I don't think anybody has like consistently thought about how would we best approaches for Linux. And I think if I think about like what would be best, I think a lot of these things would happen in the kernel. Like if you need special devices to be in a VLAN, then you in theory want to be able to create a device that's always in the streaming VLAN and not in a specific one. And then the kernel would reassign what exact VLAN that is and stuff like that, which would make things like a lot simpler. Um, realistic people are currently trying to build things in user space and it can be built in user space so there's no like requirement to change the kernel um, but it would certainly help in some regards I think uh, hi uh, hi <laughs> So this uh, reminds me a bit of um, networking functionality in Pulse Audio that I don't know if it was ever complete or um, widely used, but it, there was something like network discovery and you could just send uh, audio from one Pulse Audio system to another. And of course, that's like uh, very, very consumer focused. And I, but I wonder if this uh, could be, if it were like developed uh, in uh, and like implemented in Pipewire, it could maybe possibly serve both like super consumer stuff like I want to play audio from my laptop there over on the speakers in my kitchen or somewhat something like that uh, to like doing stage um, stuff or like building venues like this. Mm. Um, yeah, so I mean, it in theory it could be like that would be nice i think the big hindrance for that would be that like as i said you need special bridges that are avb capable and the thing i haven't told you yet is like those are expensive like yeah. around 100 euro per port or something like that um well I, I guess it gets less if you go to like 40 80 ports or something but like there's like the smallest device you can buy is like i think 400 something euros and it has five ports 
Um, okay, that's a, that's a big one. That's a big one. Um, the dream was certainly that. Like, I think AVB was actually initially developed to be like a consumer thing. So the dream was sort of like that your run of the mill bridges would start supporting those protocols and be cheap. And I don't think there's a reason that they have to be as expensive as they are right now. So they could eventually, when this becomes more commonplace, cheaper. Uh, but right now, that's probably like the biggest thing that will make that impossible. Yeah. Um, but for bridges, like say network routers, uh, is it possible to like um, have, let's say, there are um, uh, there are routers that you can run uh, custom firmware on, like OpenWRT? Uh, would it be possible to like utilize that, or do you need specific hardware to? Um, you would need. I think I ideally you would need. Um, two things you would need uh, hardware support for like um, queues so th because it, the switching fabric has to be aware of um, which packets have to be preferred over others and then you would need hardware support for time stamping though so, like when did packets go into this and get out of this um, I don't know how readily this is available right now like certainly there are various Standard switch chips that do support this, but I don't know how much they are used in consumer hardware. And if, like, how well the Linux drivers are developed to actually get access to that functionality, then in turn. Thanks. Uh, hey. Um, you, uh, you don't necessarily have to answer if, if you can't or don't want to. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I was curious if maybe you had uh, you, you could comment about the commitment that RME has uh, towards AVB because I know they also have Ravina device and Dente devices, uh, and I have to say I'm a bit uh, I, I'm I'm a bit uncertain uh, at this moment. Like, what is the what is the way forward for audio over either Ethernet or IP? Because not one protocol seems to be coming above the other, except maybe for Dante. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, like the first the slide said for a reason that I work on RME audio AVB products, like I'm not officially part of the company. Um, like I know that the, the general stance is like we play all fields, like we have, so the, the American marketing is like we have the masters of networking and then they support all of the standards. Um, Certainly, we are reasonably committed to AVB. Like we like it because we can actually. It's an open standard. We have our own implementation. We are not going to throw that away anytime soon. Um, or at least I, as a developer, could say I personally like it. I'm not doing this talk for no reason. Um, in terms of like different protocols being on the market and not one emerging as like the favorite, yeah, I I, I agree, and I don't know how we <laughs> how we fix that sort of. I mean, Dante. Realistically, is a de facto standard for the most part. Um, the PA industry lately is having some focus on AVB, and I know that like some companies went like to the point of they talked to Ordinate for a Dante license and said like, yeah, no, we're not paying that; we're doing AVB instead. Um, so there, are, there are things happening, but. All right. So you mentioned bridges a lot. Can you also just connect direct uh, two devices directly to each other without yes. bridge? Yes, that works. You get a string of pies and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Use them as routers. Like. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Thanks, uh, Flora. Thank you.